Hey guys, Young Drummer here. Uh, what you just heard was a little sound sample and some pics of the restoration project of my 1966 Ludwig Hollywood drum set in Silver Sparkle. This was the first kit that I got um, that started me on this, this wacky, zany, vintage drum journey. Up until that point, I had been playing on a Pearl um, Pearl International from the late 90s. I'm putting quotation marks because I, I can't even find that thing in a catalog anywhere. So it was real cheap. Um, basically, those would have, would have been the sort of Indonesian mahogany things. Uh, it was a 12, 13, 16, 22, but those were power toms on the really awful uh, L things that go right into the bass drum. You can never get them where you want. But anyway, I'm going to try not to ramble in this thing. So 1966, this is a kit that started me on the journey. I want to go to the into the afterlife with this kit. I never want to part with it just because it's sort of, I had such an emotional, personal attachment to this kit about getting it up and running and really getting into the sounds and what these things can do. So I absolutely love them. So where to start? 1966, just for historical context, LBJ had started his second term. Um... Uh, the top albums are things like Revolver, Pet Sounds, Dylan's Blonde on Blonde, um, and basically it's sort of kind of a magical time. You know, I, I feel like most vintage you know drum nuts are either sort of jazz guys or more heavily into like sort of the classic rock era. Um, so there's a lot of fun stuff going on. And when I when I think about 1966, and um, also in context of what was going on with the Ludwig Company, specifically what Ringo did for the Ludwig Company, that these were, they were pumping these things out of Chicago. Um, because, you know, from the 19, I think it's like 62 and 63, Ed Sullivan shows that everyone just had to have a Ludwig drum kit. And if you were lucky, you got one. It wasn't sort of an MIJ um, stencil job that you that kids would get at Christmas. But anyway, I'm going to be <laughs> trying not to ramble. So what I have going on is a 12, 13, 16, 14 by 22. I'm going to talk about sort of tom holders. I'm going to talk about plies, a little bit of the Ludwig history, but changing into the plies. The sound test that you guys heard is I was playing a 5-inch Dynasonic with the actual frame underneath just because I don't have a Superphonic handy, which would have probably been the drum that came with this kit, judging by the catalog picks. And incidentally, I'll throw up a picture of the catalog uh, pick. There's none from 1966, but there is one from 1967, but these things didn't change, and you'll see the same pictures offered at different years. Um, so they didn't really change. Not every year was a new sort of like marketing campaign. So the, the catalogs got a little bit repetitive. Hopefully that makes sense. But wh why I bring that up is in the, in the picture that I'm going to throw up here is that you could actually get these this kit with Peisty Formula 602 cymbals, when seeing that blew my mind, it must have been just amazing to have th that quality of cymbals going on with this drum set. You could also get, um, and I've seen these, I've, I've owned them, they're not that bad, is sort of the Ludwig standard Peisty cymbals, which seem like to be like an entry level cymbal set that would come with these kits if you wanted it. I don't know who was ordering custom kits back then. I think basically what you what got to the music store is probably what you got. That's my assumption in my mind. Um, what to say about it? I'm going to take the camera off in just a second and do a walkthrough about some hardware stuff. Let's get into the plies. These are three ply with reinforcement ring. I believe the reinforcement ring is made out of maple. Um, the from I believe like around the early 60s till about 1968, and I'm going to be throwing a lot of M words at you about sort of wood plies. So if it gets crazy, you know, just just let it go. Um, but from the early 60s to about 1968, and that's what these are, is a combination of mahogany, poplar, and then mahogany with a poplar sandwich in between those. Give you a very warm, tubby sound. I absolutely love them. Um, and it's, you know, if you can hear the difference sonically about what the ply that came next is sort of, I commend you, because I, I can't tell the difference with my ear. I can tell the difference between six ply that started around 1975, but I can't tell the difference between um, the different three plies. So basically, this is mahogany, poplar mahogany. What came after that, I believe, from around 1968, um, I think up until like 75, 76, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, that would have been uh, maple poplar maho mahogany, a combination of those three plies. Um, and don't fret, you can't, if you're gonna buy a kit, you can't miss with any of these. Um, and then around 1975, 76, Ludwig introduced the six ply. I always thought those were six plies of maple, solid maple, you know, like not solid shell, but plies of six plies of maple. But I just realized that um, it's a combination of uh, maple and then poplar are probably sandwiched in some kind of combination there. I never knew that. Learning something new every day. Um, so I'm going to take the, so that's the plies. 
and I'm going to take the camera off in a minute and do a walkthrough on the kit. One thing that I do want to kind of get into is if you're going to be buying these vintage kits is you're probably going to, most of you guys are going to be using your own sort of mounting system. But um, what I have on this thing, and you'll see me when I walk around the kit, is I have the, the Hollywood, the double tom holder. And it's, it's hard, a little bit hard to explain, but in the early 60s, um, the Hollywood kit was offered with two 12-inch toms. And those would go into this clip system. I'll, show, I'll throw a pic of this as well, which was kind of a goofy affair. You couldn't, you could only move them like Slingerland. You could only, you, they didn't move independently, I believe. And they had this wood circle that protected from Tom Rash. Um, so it was kind of like a, a kind of a primitive kind of a thing going on there. What they moved into next, which is my favorite one, is was, was what I have, which is what Ringo had on the rooftop. Um, you'll see pictures of that. It's a, this plate that held the alarms. I feel like I like that one better than the one that came later. The one that came later, as most people are more sort of familiar with to your eye, is the late 60s, early 70s Ludwig. It's sort of a curved bar with black lettering that says Ludwig on it, and the two alarms sit there. But what I don't like about that one, actually hate it actually, is that it sits into this cog affair, these two cogs that kind of move together like on cymbal stands and stuff. And I can never get it flush where I want it. I always want it in a middle position. I just can't get it. But you don't have that problem with the one that I have. Um, so, all right. What else to talk about? 1966, all the serial, you know, the serials, they're different, but they kind of all kind of match up to around 1966. When I, you know, in addition, I, um, I bought an additional 15 inch an additional 18 inch, a 15 by 12, and an 18 by 16. As you guys know, I'm a Smashing Pumpkins fan, and you've seen other videos where I have, um, you know, right to the left of my 12 inch Tom, that's where the 15 inch sits on a stand, and then I have the 18 over here, and I'll, I'll bring that up. But the interesting thing about that, the 18, luck would have it, as I got the 18, and it turned out it was from 1966 with a date stamp on there, so that matches up with, you know, all of these are white paint, the later stuff. Um, after 1968 moved into a clear coat and then later after that it became a granitone this gray speckled kind of affair Talking a lot. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna take the camera off the tripod and walk you through the hardware of these things And then I'm also going to show you pics of the bearing edges. That's what's on the agenda I'm gonna do a sound test uh, of the five piece to get a little, let you guys hear another sort of sound test on it And then I'm gonna do an additional sound test what it sounds like with the 15 and the 18 So we're just get busy. All right Okie doke. Super out of focus. There we go. That's better. All right. So here is the five piece. You could probably tell that um, I'm using stands from the 70s, the, the Hercules line Ludwig stands that I absolutely love. Very durable, very versatile, and incidentally, I also use them as camera tripods because this, this is our Hercules. That's with the original sticker, really chewed up. You can get replacement stickers. The hardware chains to plastic things that are, that are much more kind of like, these things are really built like a tank. All of, all of this stuff is built like a tank. Um, but this, the symbol tops on these things, um, I don't want this focus. Anyway, um, the symbol tops on those things will fit, it's, that fits most universal cameras um, on those tripods so that's just an interesting fun fact so if you have a bunch of cymbal stands lying around you don't you may not need to buy a camera tripod if you're going to be getting into doing videos all right here it goes this is what i was referencing this is sort of my favorite ludwig double tom mount i've never owned a kit with a rail consulate i never hold on to one of those those are tricky for me but i can get them to work and this guy you can sort of see some scarring going on that when I did my first restoration, I didn't really know what I was doing and I put some navel jelly on this because these things were really in bad shape. So the chrome was already gonna be gone with it. But it was so new, I didn't even know if, if I could get the rust off of chrome. And anyway, so <laughs> the double tom, tom mount. What I like about this is there is a hex nut here and there's a hex nut behind this. When you got the drum set, you got a key, and you also got a hex key to change these hex nuts. Um, and if they were if they were nuts as opposed to thumb screw thumb uh, wing nuts, that's what you used. Uh, you got to put some muscle into it just because it's sort of to get these where you want them. Uh, it does take a little bit of elbow grease because the hex nuts can stick, and it's just you know you really have to kind of get it tight on there and getting it off. It's it's a little bit laborious. 
but right here is this is without that cog system that came on the later ones so i find that when you when you loosen this hex loosen that hex you can get where you want the tom to kind of go more efficiently than i think the one that came later and you can this is definitely more versatile than its predecessor as i mentioned all right so that's the tom double tom holder usually on the small toms the 12 inches they went aesthetically with a smaller lug on the 13 inch there are larger lugs that lug right there on the 13 inch tom matches both the floor tom lugs you probably can't see that but it also matches that size matches the bass drum lugs when i got this somebody had put i'm assuming an l-arm symbol holder and they um, put a mount there incidentally these mounts are used for uh, floor tom legs and the toms even the spurs so there is that. This is sort of one of the early kind of diamond plate things for the Tom mount, where it looks more aluminum. They later, sort of in the 70s, they were more sort of coming in a chrome. Um, the, what were these called? I just found out what these were called. I love the spurs on these. There's the mount. Here, let me get a, a better image of it. Why I love them is they don't go into the drum shell, like a telescopic thing. And I believe that these are called something like gull wing or something like that, where they fold and curve when, you, when you're traveling. You just basically undo that, and this kind of contours with the shell of the drum so it doesn't poke out. They're incredibly sharp, and they hold pretty steady. So basically, you just angle them to where you want them. Um, and you do this kind of both at the same time. I tend to like my bass drum the the front lugs i like them to be a little bit off the ground because i find i get a little bit more resonation or oomph out of there there it is again floor tom incidentally these are, these are the keystone badges these are they have a serial number on them i'll throw picks up this isn't really focusing too well and i yeah another thing to talk about is i took off the baseball bat mufflers i have them lying around these are white felt baseball bat mufflers. So when you want to turn on a muffler, it's not a knob thing. It's basically you flip it up and flip it down. What I find if I leave them on, they would kind of creep up a little bit and muffle just a little bit. And I, I like my drums to be open and sync. So this is a player's kit for me. It's not a museum piece at all. The wrap is pretty ginger ale um, but not too bad. You can still kind of get that it's silver sparkle. I bought, when I redid the hoops, came with original hoops, and I repainted them, sanded them, and bought some inlay for it. As you could sort of see that there's the new inlay as opposed to the original. But, you know, I'm very happy with the way it looks. And thankfully enough, the, the other toms kind of match up. All right. Lastly, a little fun fact is the legs on this floor tom, these are the long legs that came later. I believe, I don't know what the error is, but when I got this kit, um, the floor tom legs, they were Ludwig, but they were sort of really short. So I think there are something like 17 inches. So I tend to have my high tom a little bit higher than that. So it was really getting down to this tip of this would be around here. So it's just something to consider if you want to use original Ludwig stuff is if you have your floor tom a bit higher, uh, if the kit comes with those short ones, you're just going to have to kind of take that into consideration. But that's all kind of nitpicky OCD kind of stuff. All right, guys. So that's a little bit of a walkthrough. Oh, I forgot this. If you are recording with a vintage Lego kit and you have rattle, it could be something like this where if you're not using the mounts, you know, just basically like that's kind of like common sense that those things might be rattling. But on this, I can even feel it that these tension rods... These T things, they're identified as, you know, you could see that they're, they're, they're Ludwig, they're everywhere on Ludwig stuff, but they rattle a little bit where this T thing separates from this male-female post and go around and check them. You may have a loose one. In that case, you have to kind of pry it off, get some super glue, and jam it back on there. I've even sort of taken some off. I got to do the, the Speed King thing. I want to show you something else. So that's a common problem. Why am I breathing so heavy? It's like, ugh. Don't take offense. All right. 
We're gonna get through this. All right. Let me put this down here and bring up my speaking. But I also want to show you. Um, at in various times when I let me turn that off. Sometimes I will replace the T rods, which is a long um, key tension rod because sometimes I like to get my floor tom closer to the bass drum depending on the setup that I have, and these tend to bump into it. I also have done that, yeah, you can see this down here, depending on the pedal that I'm using, these T-rods can get in the way of the pedal because they're, they're just kind of like a little bit too close together, so sometimes I'll do that. All right, all right, let me catch my breath. Okay. This is very important when it comes to a vintage Ludwig kit. The Speed King. I use wooden beaters because they just like the additional weight of the beater itself. And you can get one of these and don't be intimidated by this. It's actually a really fun project if you don't mind getting your hands dirty. When you get these, these are usually, the action on it is usually terrible. If not, like almost seized up like an engine. How this guy works is in these two posts, there are compression springs with um, an inside kind of post. So when you press the foot pedal down, there's a little clip and a bearing edge in here. It presses the stick down and compresses the spring and gives you the action to come back. So that's how that works. It's different than having a spring here or here. So it's just, it's when you can dial these things in, these things are amazing. And how you do that, well, first of all, is when these left the factory, they were left, the lubricant is something called lithium grease. And over the decades, that will gum up and become clayish and really gross. It just looks like brown baby poop. I can't really, <laughs> how else would I describe it? Um, it's perfectly fine to get rid of it, but it's the trick is, is getting into this mechanism. So this is what you do. Take a hammer, you take a drumstick, and you bang this pretty significantly mid post. This cap, I don't know if I can get a close up on that, but um, this cap says Ludwig on there. It's just sort of a cap that keeps the mechanism protected. It just jams in there. But when you hit it mid, this is, you could probably see mine's a little discolored probably from where I hit it. Uh, the cap pops off. And in addition to that, this is, this is important, is you guys have probably seen these before. There are two screws that give you access. When you unscrew this, screw and that screw. It's just a little tiny cap, like a bottle cap, and it comes out threaded. And then you remove the post and then you remove the thing. All of that would be pretty gummed up and gross. And then just basically soak those parts in a degreasing solution, clean them up with a toothbrush. What I do is I will jam some Q-tips in there with some toilet paper and sort of, when you, when you take this out, when you take the spring and the mechanism out, you're also gonna be taking out a bearing edge up here. It's kind of, don't get intimidated. You can't, you can't miss with not putting it back together. It's pretty easy to put it, put it all back together. And you'll see the mechanics of the tab that I'm speaking of that presses this down. Um, and basically what I do is as best as I can, I clean out all of that gummed up clayish lubricant that's decades old and basically clean it out to the best of my ability. You go to the hardware store and you get some new lithium grease, comes in a spray thing, it's almost like um, WD-40. And then you just re-lube. It's just sort of a process. It's almost like sort of changing, it's, no, it's more complex than changing guitar strings, but it's just something that needs to be done over time. Um, just a tip, you just kind of have to watch to have equal tension on both sides to get the pedal to be more efficient, in my mind. These things can squeak and they can rattle. I think that that adds to the charm. Um, I did a video on Since I've Been Loving You by Led Zeppelin, and there's, you can just hear these kind of, when these would squeak, it sounds like sort of seagulls. You can hear that on the recording, and that's what's going on. But, you know, you know, he's, you know, Bonham swore by the Speed King pedal, I believe. I think, right? All right, anyway, um, wooden beater, you take this, you know, unscrew this, it comes out. You may need, I believe that this is called a bushing. Sometimes that these are missing. And you can kind of, you can get um, new ones 
new old stock. I've run across those on eBay and replaced them. But basically, and if you don't want to do on that, there's plenty of guys that sell refurbished ones for like a hundred bucks, but if you can get it cheaper, but I like doing things hands-on and learning. And so just like, that was like a really kind of fun, but yet gross <laughs> thing. Um, and then, but when you do get, when you do get this dialed in and you get it sort of tuned up to where you want it, it's a very satisfying pedal. Um, it and not satisfying at all if it's gummed up. My first drum set that I ever bought at a flea market years ago, um, when I was like 11, had a Speed King, and I just it was like it was like pulling teeth to get it to come back. So, all right, so that's what's going on. So let's get into the sound test. Here's how it looks at the other two tops.
Okay, so this is pretty interesting. So I've taken all the heads off back to the bearing edges. There's something really kind of interesting going on here that's contradicting what I had sort of researched. So basically, here is the five, the five piece kit or the four toms. And I thought that these, like I said earlier in the video, I thought that these were a combination of mahogany on the outside, pop on the inside. I will show you guys a pic because I don't think the, the camera can really kind of focus. Maybe it can. Okay, but can it focus? A little bit. Okay. So, yeah, I'm probably not, I'm going to do this with the camera. But so basically, these what I thought that these drums, the original five piece that I bought, I thought that those were mahogany, poplar, mahogany. 1966 as the literature states, or maybe I'm just wrong, maybe I read it wrong. But basically it looks like to my eye that these are the inside ply is maple, the middle is poplar, and the outside is mahogany. Which, if you come over here to the floor tom, which there is uh, a date stamp on this guy, right there. I'll also get a pick, August 17th, 1966. And on the edge of this one, it's clear as day that you know, I'll throw a pickup, that this, this is early, the serial number on this says it's earlier 1966, but clear to my eyes, mahogany, poplar, mahogany, where the other ones are the outside ply of mahogany, poplar, and the inside looks to be maple. And then coming he, over here to a later drum, the 15 by 12, which I had the bearing edges redone on this guy. So it's much easier to tell this matches this. So there's a funny kind of thing kind of going on here. I wonder if this basically that these were sort of shells that were about to be kind of rolled out to the new line. Who knows? And it's just kind of a nitpicky thing. There's really no sonic difference to my ear. But maple, poplar, maple. Maple, poplar, no, I'm sorry, maple, poplar, mahogany, maple, poplar, mahogany, all the way till you get to this floor tom. So it's sort of the literature in the early 1966 is saying, is sort of correct, but these don't sort of make sense. So maybe there's some kind of conspiracy that I don't know about, or I just read things wrong, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really make that much of a sonic difference at all to my ear. Um, so a little bit of the, the timeline history is, is that, and I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you like it. Uh, also tell me which one you might, which kit should I do next? I have a 1960s teardrop that I re-veneered, that's a 2013-16 matching snare drum, um, or the Slingerland Radio King, which has uh, a really interesting historical kind of context to it, and, or, you can't really see it, but there's a Slingerland kit back there from the, 19, from the 1960s or 70s, that's also one. So let me know what you guys wanna, hope you, what you guys wanna see next. Have a good one, thanks.